Okay, so let's start maybe. Yes. Sure. Sure. Okay, so welcome to this uh, annual conference of the SCORE PSE uh, chair, which is uh, in an unusual format. Well, I guess everybody is used to it now except myself. Um, so um, <coughs> it's the third conference of this chair because uh, <coughs> it started uh, two years ago. Um, and it's the last one of uh, this actual chair. Uh, hopefully, uh, things will be uh, renewed and continue in, in the future. So um, this, um, this chair is very uh, useful for PSC. It helps us uh, financing lots of things, a macro seminar, um, uh, grants for students, uh, travel, research assistance, all the portfolio of, uh, of academic uh, activities. And uh, we hope it's also useful for, for SCORE. Uh, it has stimulated, uh, we think, um, a lot of research on the broad topic of, um, of macroeconomic uh, risk. Um, we circulate a specific working paper series for uh, for this chair we have had uh, lots of uh, very prestigious uh, speakers both for the conference uh, keynote lecture uh, the annual conference keynote lecture and also uh, for the uh, uh, specific uh, score and annu annual lecture so um, that's been a very uh, successful and uh, productive uh, partnership. Um, we also um, um, promote uh, young researchers with uh, a SCORE PSC uh, annual prize, uh, which is uh, specifically uh, given to um, an outstanding uh, research paper written uh, on, uh, on macroeconomic risk. And um, uh, Lots of topics uh, have been um, uh, uh, dealt with uh, in our activities, uh, systemic risk, uh, contagion, contagion in, uh, in, in networks, for example. You can um, um, check our dedicated web page and our newsletter to, um, um, uh, to um, have some idea of uh, all the activities of the chair. Um, so today it's the uh, annual uh, conference and um, we tried to um, focus a little bit on a specific uh, theme which is uh, household default and household risk so there will be a sort of you know pr plurality of papers that will deal with um, with those issues okay um and I guess uh, uh, that's everything, that's all I had to say. Uh, now, what's important is the instructions for um, the uh, 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 format of each talk. And so I give the floor to Axel, who is going to give you very detailed instructions about what you are supposed to do and also what you are supposed not to do. And then we right. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so quick instructions. So the, each speaker is going to present for 15 minutes. And during this time, we can ask uh, clarification, uh, clarification questions on the chat. And Gilles is going to share, and Gilles will basically pass the questions to the speaker. And then at the end, we'll have 10 minutes of open discussion. So we'll unmute all of you, both panelists and atten attendees. So I mean, we'll give you the, the possibility to unmute yourself. So that you can ask questions or intervene uh, spontaneously. All right, so I guess we are just in time. Uh, so Ben, the floor is yours. Okay, so you have 15 minutes. And basically don't pay attention to the chat. Uh, I will interrupt you if there is uh, a good enough clarification question that deserves you know, interruption. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so just in case this wasn't clear to everyone, 
the program got switched around a bit. Uh, um, and so I'm going first rather than Claude Ferreira. So, uh, and I'm going to present uh, this paper that maybe some of you have seen a very early version of uh, about uh, the current COVID-19 crisis. And I guess the risks of the COVID-19 crisis uh, in keeping with the theme of the conference. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, Greg Kaplan and Gianluca Violante. Um, actually, let me maybe put the link of the slides uh, in the chat, um, just in case this is useful. Oops, where is it? Chat. Chat. Um, okay. Not quite sure. Oh, there you go. Now it's only all panelists, but uh, Okay, here are, the, here are the slides in case you maybe can share them with, with, with other people. Okay, so um, <clears throat> here's what we do in this paper. So in the US and I guess also many other countries, uh, in particular uh, advanced countries like France, uh, the policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic has, I would say, broadly consisted of a two-pronged strategy. So on the one hand, lockdowns, uh, which consist of restricting economic activity, uh, that facilitates the spread of the virus, like work and workplace and social activities in particular, and uh, fiscal stimulus, uh, which in the United States uh, took the form of the uh, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Securities Act, so the, the CARES Act. Um, our goal here will be, in this paper, will be to quantify uh, two separate types of trade-offs that are inherent in uh, these uh, types of policies. So first, uh, a, an aggregate trade-off between sort of lives on the one hand and livelihoods on the other hand. And second, uh, another trade-off between sort of who bears the economic costs associated with the drop in economic activity, both due uh, to the virus itself and uh, uh, lockdown measures. Um, and this is sort of a difficult debate to wade into, uh, particularly the question of lives versus livelihoods, um, because most discussions uh, require one to take uh, in a way, a stand on the sort of economic value of life. And we're not going to want to do that. And instead, in order to make progress here, we're going to advocate uh, or use an approach that we call uh, the sort of distributional pandemic possibility frontier in analogy to sort of a production possibility frontier, I guess, uh, that allows us to compare the effects of alternative policies uh, without taking such a stand on the economic value of life. And this uh, distributional pandemic possibility frontier it's going to be a diagram uh, that shows the distribution of economic costs uh, and total of number of lives lost uh, associated with different policies. An example, uh, and I'm only going to flash this by you very quickly and show you it uh, in more detail later. An example looks like this. So you kind of have deaths on the x-axis and some measure of economic welfare costs on the y-axis. So obviously where you kind of want to be is uh, as close as possible to the origin. But then because of the pandemic, you're not going to be able uh, uh, to, to achieve that. But then the question is sort of what's the set of uh, points you can uh, uh, achieve with different policies. And in particular, uh, um, one thing I'm gonna, we're going to emphasize is that uh, there isn't just one number for each policy. Instead, there's a whole distribution of outcomes across the population. So these shaded areas, I'll explain to you this in more detail later, are going to be sort of uh, uh, different percentile ranges um, of the of the economic outcomes or the economic welfare costs. Okay, um, and I'll explain all of this in more detail and and tell you what exactly all these numbers mean. Um, the the goal or one of the goals that we're going to uh, pursue here, uh, besides quantifying these trade-offs and putting numbers on these things, is also to seek policies um, that sort of flatten this frontier, so give you a better framework uh, trade-off and shift this frontier closer towards the origin. Um, I so have a clarification question. Uh, the, the frontier on the horizontal axis, is that COVID deaths or total deaths? COVID deaths. So basically, if people die of depression and uh, because they are unemployed, uh, not yeah. taken into account. So, no, we're not taking that into account. I have somewhere in the end of the slides, uh, a long, long list of all the things we're not taking into account. Uh, and I think this is uh, listed on, uh, as one of them. Um, but yes, I guess in principle, you could uh, 
uh, take this into account. We, the reason we don't take it into account is that uh, our model is already complicated enough with all the things we take into account and we do not have a depression uh, in, in the model or, or generally a, a feedback from the economic outcomes to deaths. It's something we do not have in the model, but you could uh, think about incorporating this. Okay, so let me continue. So here's how we do it. Um, so we're gonna use uh, a sort of a combined epidemiological and macroeconomic model. So in particular, we're gonna uh, integrate uh, an SIR model, which I, I think uh, all of you have seen at this point, um, with a heterogeneous agent uh, macro model uh, with a bunch of necessary ingredients. Um, and we're gonna sort of take here uh, sort of the opposite uh, approach as uh, some other work, for example, by Marty, uh, where it's all very clean and simple, um, we're gonna sort of go and sort of throw the full Monty at it, at it and have like lots of richness and, and complications that we think are, are important though. Um, so here's the type of things we're gonna have. So we're gonna have different sectors. Um, in particular, we're gonna have uh, different types of consumption goods. We're gonna have what we're gonna call regular consumption goods. We're gonna have what we call a social interaction consumption or social consumption goods where the uh, definition of social consumption is goods where if you consume them, it requires physical interactions with other people. Like, for example, going to a restaurant or uh, uh, traveling, getting on a plane and sitting next to people. And finally, we're also gonna have home production um, uh, where the idea is you can substitute for, uh, say, foregone social consumption by uh, doing more of it at home. So for example, if you don't go to a restaurant as much anymore, you may just uh, cook more at home. Uh, which we think is an important margin of substitution. We're going to have three types of labor as well. We're going to have um, uh, traditional labor in the workplace. Uh, we're going to have uh, remote work. Again, we think that's sort of an important margin of substitution. And then we're going to have uh, the hours of work you put into home production, so uh, cooking at home safe. Um, we're going to have different occupations that go are going to differ uh, along a number of dimensions in particular related to these sectors uh, and uh, types of labor here. So these occupations are gonna differ first in what we call flexibility for remote work. Um, so how good you are at doing your job at home. So for example, if you're uh, uh, an academic, maybe you, you're actually relatively good at doing your job at home, but if you're a waiter, uh, you're not. Um, we have different sectoral intensities of occupations. So some occupations are gonna be more intensely employed in the production of these social goods. Uh, again, restaurant workers are more intensely employed in the, in the hospitality industry. And finally, we're gonna have some essential workers uh, who, who can continue to keep working during lockdowns. We're gonna have, as in uh, this huge exploding uh, uh, sort of epidemiological macroeconomics literature pioneered by, by Marty and others, sort of a two-way uh, behavioral feedback between uh, uh, the virus on the one hand and economic activity on the other hand. Um, we're also gonna take very seriously uh, something we see in the data very strongly, uh, and I'm gonna show you later, which is that the economic exposure to the pandemic, so in particular, how much different uh, households' uh, incomes fall, uh, seems to be strongly correlated with uh, their financial vulnerability, uh, specifically how much liquid wealth they have. And I'll show you that occupations that are hit harder uh, typically have uh, less liquid wealth. So again, think about waiters here. Um, we're gonna, gonna calibrate this model to the US economy and examine a bunch of counterfactuals. Um, in particular, we're gonna think about uh, what if you just hadn't intervened at all? Uh, so that's obviously a counterfactual we haven't really seen in any country in the world um, versus uh, different lockdown policies. Uh, um, and then in particular, how does uh, fiscal stimulus uh, interact with these lockdown policies and maybe alleviate some of the economic costs. And there we're gonna to try to take relatively seriously the different components of the CARES Act. Um, after we've done that, so this is the main exercise where we trace out the sort of pandemic possibility frontier. Uh, we're gonna to try to uh, find sort of smarter policies. And in particular, we're gonna use the richness of our model to think about sort of more targeted lockdowns than maybe what we've seen in practice. And another thing we're gonna think about is uh, maybe you can, rather than doing sort of blunt lockdowns, you can use Peguvian taxes on particular sectors uh, or activities uh, uh, to, to do sort of a, a more nuanced, softer version of a lockdown. 
Okay, here's what we find. So we find, first of all, that the economic uh, welfare costs of the pandemic are A, large, and B, uh, very heterogeneous. Uh, this is true regardless of the policy response, okay? Even if you did nothing, uh, uh, sort of a counterfactual where there's no interaction, no lockdowns, uh, there would have been, uh, through the lens of our models, huge economic uh, welfare costs because of this behavioral feedback from the virus to economic activity, so there's sort of a fear factor. Um, and it was, would have also been heterogeneous. Um, one thing that does differ quite strongly uh, is uh, between the laissez-faire and, and different lockdowns uh, is who bears the costs of these economic policies. And I'll explain this uh, in more detail later. In particular, there's gonna be uh, differences across these occupations. Um, finally, we're gonna find that uh, the largest welfare costs uh, for different policies are actually typically in the middle of the earnings distributions. Uh, and I'll explain this in more detail, but essentially the reason is that the people at the top aren't really hit that much. Uh, and the people at the bottom, while they hit a lot, uh, they, they get kind of a, a lot of support from, from the fiscal stimulus uh, package we've seen uh, in the US. So the CARES Act, which is very, very redistributive. Second uh, main result, I would say, is about the slope of this PPF, this pandemic possibility frontier. Um, what we find is it sort of varies, so, so how strong the trade-off is sort of between lives and livelihoods, varies strongly with the length of the lockdown, okay? Uh, and uh, I'll explain this to you uh, uh, later. There's gonna be large differences driven by uh, sort of ICU constraints, how many hospital beds are there, and how close you can get, uh, how many people you can sort of save before there's a vaccine. Um, finally, uh, I think this is sort of interesting because it sort of reconciles uh, conflicting views on uh, the extent to which there is uh, health uh, versus wealth or lives versus livelihoods trade off. So really you can get very different results depending on where you are on this frontier. And third main result uh, for the US CARES Act, if you just look what's the marginal effect on that in an economy with a lockdown, we find that it was actually very effective in reducing economic costs. In particular, we find that it reduced economic welfare costs by on average 20%. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, and it's at the same time highly redistributive um, uh, and it doesn't really completely uh, eliminate this heterogeneity in the welfare costs. Um, another interesting thing we find relative to a literature you may have seen uh, on, on how consumption responses have different, differed across the income distribution is that uh, while the incomes of the poorest households have actually fallen the most during the pandemic, there was this sort of a puzzling finding a little bit uh, that consumption of the poorest households actually recovered the fastest. So there's papers by uh, Natalie Cox et al. And, and Chetty and so on. And our model can sort of replicate that, which we uh, think is kind of nice. Uh, and then two more things in terms of these taxation-based sort of Pigouvian alternatives to lockdowns, they do a lot better in terms of uh, uh, sort of flattening this frontier or shifting out this frontier. Um, but, uh, uh, so in that sense, one should do these policies, but we think implementation may be potentially difficult because what we find is that there's more dispersion in the welfare cost, in some cases quite extreme. Finally, and then, yeah. uh, there is a question. Uh, do you take into account uh, heterogeneity by age in your uh, welfare analysis? Uh, no. That's also on my long list of things that we do not take into account. Um, and uh, yeah, in particular, if you think about the distribution of death rates, um, obviously that would be extremely important. And we're sort of concentrating mostly on the distribution of uh, welfare costs, uh, the, the, so economic welfare costs. Um, and, and there didn't seem like, to us at least, the, the uh, prime consideration, and again, we wanted to put richer heterogeneity on the occupations and so on, so we don't have the age dimension. But of course, uh, uh, extremely important uh, for, for future work maybe. Okay, finally, uh, one more sort of prediction that comes out of our model and we thought was kind of, that we thought was kind of interesting is if you just run our model for it uh, for the fall and winter, obviously, you know, we should take this uh, uh, with a grain of salt uh, because especially the epidemiological model is very simplistic, um, is that what we find is that with sort of the, the current, what seems to be the current US policy response in particular, 
no second lockdown and uh, no additional fiscal stimulus, um, there, our model would predict that there uh, will be a second wave of infections. And then you'll get a double dip recession where the first dip was due to the lockdown we've already seen. Uh, and then the second dip is due to uh, the second wave in the associated behavioral response. So just sort of fear factor to that. Um, okay, that was uh, the introduction. So yeah, maybe if there's other questions, um, I could also take them uh, now quickly. If not, I'll press ahead. Okay, so let me go ahead. Um, so I'll, I'll first show you the model, uh, then I'll talk about the parameterization only very briefly due to time constraints, and then I'll uh, focus a fair amount on the results, hopefully. Okay, so the model kind of has these two building blocks, sort of the epi block and the econ block. Um, we're gonna be uh, relatively simple on the epi block. Uh, and much richer on the econ block because that's our comparative advantage, I suppose. Um, on the epi block, we're gonna just basically take a somewhat more complicated uh, SIR model uh, with, with a bunch of extra compartments uh, to think in particular about uh, uh, ICU constraints. So uh, we're gonna, as usual, have sort of as a class of people that are uh, susceptible to the virus, which is initially almost everyone. And then there's some people who are infectious, um, and there are some people who recovered. Uh, in addition, we have this sort of a, an exposed state here, uh, which just means that um, you've been infected already, but are not yet infectious. So it's an SEIR model. And then we're going to have uh, one more bucket, which is people who are uh, in the ICU. Uh, the only way you may ultimately die in our model is if you end up in an ICU, and then there's a death probability from this ICU. Um, the reason why we have that is because we want to think about capacity constraints in hospitals. Um, finally, we're going to use, we're going to just denote the entire population here as N, which is just the sum of these different uh, compartments. Um, to sort of summarize uh, how these people move across these uh, different uh, buckets, uh, we find it useful to just write things in terms of a transition matrix. Um, so these are then the differential equations for this uh, SEICR, I guess, model. Uh, and you can see you have the, the usual uh, thing, which is that um, at rate beta, uh, uh, some people uh, who are in the susceptible bucket meet someone in the infectious bucket and uh, uh, get infected. Um, Importantly, this beta, as is, I guess, by now standard in, in these sort of epidemiological macro models, uh, depends in some way on economic activity. Okay, so this beta here has a T, and in particular, in, in the end, it's going to be a, a function that we're going to calibrate somehow of um, how much social consumption there is, okay, and how much people work in the workplace. So how much do people go to restaurants? and how much do people go to work and commute and meet in the office. That's gonna be the determinants of the virus transmission. Then you move across these buckets according to some Poisson rates, uh, which I'm not gonna get into in detail. And then finally, uh, if you're in the ICU state, so this one here, uh, there's a, a death rate that we denote by P uh, or lambda C times P, uh, uh, with which you, uh, rather than ending up in the recovered bucket, you end up in this dead bucket. Um, this death rate here, this death probability of the people in the ICU state, so these C guys, is gonna in particular depend uh, on uh, whether uh, the hospitals or the, the ICUs are below or above capacity. And so we're, if, if the ICUs are overloaded, there's a higher death probability. Um, that's kind of it, okay? Um, now, with this in mind, I'm gonna to go to the economic model. Um, as I've said, we, we try to take quite seriously heterogeneity across different occupations, okay? Um, we're gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the equations in a second, but we're gonna in particular uh, take into account the following uh, heterogeneity across uh, uh, occupations. So on the one hand, uh, some people uh, or some occupations are gonna be flexible in terms of being able to uh, work remotely and some other occupations are, are rigid, uh, so meaning they cannot work remotely very well. And then uh, sort of juxtaposed with that, some occupations are more intensely employed in the production of 
regular consumption goods and some uh, occupations are more intensely employed in the production of uh, what we call social consumption goods, again, uh, uh, goods that require social interaction and where virus transmission is more likely. Um, I'll talk about how we calibrate this later. Essentially, we're gonna just go through sort of the uh, uh, standard occupational classification and put people into different buckets. But here are some uh, examples just to fix your ideas. Um, for example, we think software engineers are, uh, uh, is an occupation where you can work from home relatively well and you don't really need to interact with other people or the good you're producing uh, doesn't require uh, people who consume it to interact with other people. Uh, so they would be up here. In contrast, uh, uh, say waiters um, are both employed in an industry uh, that's re where, where, where consuming the good requires interacting with other people. So it's a social good, the hospitality industry, and they also just cannot work well from home. Uh, uh, and so they're in this bucket here. So what you can already see, what's gonna happen basically, just to already preview this, is that people in these, in this bottom right hand corner, uh, in, in these occupations are gonna be hit the hardest by both uh, the virus and lockdown measures. Um, and uh, people up here are gonna be less hit, uh, uh, hard hit. There's also gonna be some essential occupations. Um, essential occupations here are just defined as uh, uh, occupations that can continue to work during the lockdown, okay? Um, so here's some examples, but there's also other things in there like dentists, for example. Okay, here are the equations for this, uh, the way we model this. Um, so flexibility is here modeled in a very simple fashion. It's gonna be just be modeled as the substitutability between uh, remote work and workplace hours. In particular, we're gonna denote by LJW, uh, the labor supply of occupation J in the workplace. Um, so hours worked in the workplace and by LJR, uh, hours worked remotely. And then the idea is that basically total sort of efficiency units of labor of a particular occupation uh, is the sum here, where in particular your remote hours are gonna be weighed by a factor phi j that's gonna be in general less than one, which uh, tells you for each occupation how good a substitute is uh, a remote work for workplace hours. So in particular, some of the occupations up here say are gonna have a phi j that's very close to one, and some of the occupations uh, over here uh, have a phi j that's very close to zero or uh, closer to, or smaller. Right, but, but technically it's always perfect substitute. Uh, yes, on the, that the coefficient. Yes, on the production side, uh, these are perfect substitutes. But then we're going to have imperfect substitutability on the labor supply side. Okay. So, so we're, that there's there is going to be some curvature. So it's not going to be the case that you're going to have like bang bang solutions where you're going to switch. Uh, so, so, so when you the classification between flexible and rigid is that about. The fees, or is that about uh, substitutability in the disutility of labor? No, it's about the fees. Okay. We're going to have the same substitutability of disutility of labor for all occupations. All right. The only difference between the occupations is going to be about the fees. Okay. <laughs> the second uh, heterogeneity across occupations, again, is, is, is this dimension here. So are you in a C intensive or S intensive occupation? Um, it's going to be these different employment intensities in these sectors. The way we model this is for each sector I, there's an aggregate production function here, and then each sector aggregates uh, uh, these different uh, uh, labor types or these different occupations. And then some sectors are gonna more intensely use some occupations. That's gonna be these size here, okay? Uh, I, I mean, yeah, I don't think it, there's that much point talking through the equations a lot more. If you got the, the example up here, I think you kind of got it. Um, okay. That was the occupations. Uh, now let me briefly tell you uh, about how we model the households, where again, there's a lot of richness. And then I'll, after that, I'll just show you the rest of the model and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty done with the model presentation. Okay. So this is gonna be a standard heterogeneous Asian macro model. People are gonna be uh, uh, forward looking, maximize a present discounted value, expected discounted value from of utility from consumption. Um, but let me just show you here uh, the period utility uh, uh, that, that these, these guys have. 
Uh, in particular, there's going to be some slightly non-standard elements, so I just want to highlight these so, so it's clear what we're doing. Okay. I've already said there's sort of uh, three types of consumption goods. Um, so the regular consumption here, C, uh, the social consumption here, S, and sort of home production here, H. And there's uh, three types of labor supply. So workplace hours, LW, uh, remote hours, LR, and the, uh, the labor input into home production, H. The reason these are the same is because there's one-to-one -one, uh, production technology, one hour of labor produces one hour of home production goods. Um, the non-standard thing, of course, here is these uh, upsilons floating around in there. Uh, so what's that? This is uh, gonna be a disutility uh, uh, of infection risk, okay? So this D dot here, in particular, is deaths in the economy, okay? Which comes from the SIR model. So I should have had that on the slides, maybe. So death, the D dot is the flow out of the C state uh, at, at this rate here uh, of people dying, okay? And we're just gonna sort of hardwire or stick that in the utility function in this reduced form, okay? What's this meant to capture? This is meant to capture sort of a fear factor uh, whereby uh, if, if there's a lot of people dying around you because there's a raging epidemic, you're not gonna like going to restaurants anymore that much. Uh, and you're not going to like commuting to work and seeing your colleagues in the office anymore that much. Um, and the higher our deaths, the less you're going to do of these things. Okay. Now, obviously, this is sort of uh, a bit of a reduced form uh, uh, thing that we're doing here. We could have uh, probably endogenized it um, in the way, say, uh, Marty and others have. Uh, but this is what we do. And then the key, of course, is going to how we is going to be how you discipline uh, these epsilon functions, in particular the elasticity of those functions with respect to this, these deaths, D dot in there. Okay, uh, these households here, they're gonna, uh, again, you know, behave kind of like in an extended Iagari model. Uh, so they're gonna have these, these budget constraints uh, here. Uh, this is budget constraints of, of sort of healthy households. Uh, we're gonna classify everyone as healthy enough to work uh, unless they're, in the in the hospital in the ICU okay everyone else even the infected people we're gonna for simplicity lump them uh, uh, together with the healthy households ben, the, uh, I, Axel has a question okay about your specification actually I was going to ask something similar uh, so your specification I guess it's a shortcut but it implies that this utility depends on infections rather than death, like, you know, um, looks like a behavioral model, but of course the reason why I don't like S and I don't like W is that I might die, right? So... Uh, no, no, but D dot is death. Yeah, D dot is death, right. But it's a shortcut for the fact that there's a probability of dying if I do S. Yes. And then, of course, you have to take a stand about what happens when you die, right? I mean, does your utility fall to zero? Uh, yeah, our, in, in our model, our utility, uh, uh, people's utility, once they die, falls to zero. Um, no, in your model, you don't die. In your model, you have a representative household who does not like D dot, but there is there, no? No, no, but I mean, you do, so if you move to the, if you move to the ICU state and then you get a, uh, say the ICUs are overcrowded uh, and you get unlucky, then you are going to die and your okay. utility is going to fall to zero. Why and, do you need the new S and new Ls at all? Uh, no, because what we don't have um, is that uh, people sort of, can, can sort of react to uh, what the state of the epidemic is or what, what we don't have, sorry, that's the, the wrong way of, of saying it, is that people sort of take, uh, so if we didn't have that and the only, uh, so let, me, let me think this through. So if we don't- uh, because, have, because, because your IRS or whatever model does not formalize the uh, uh, contagion in the specific S or W setting, right? Yeah, exactly. It's an aggregate model. Yeah, 
right? Exa yeah, exactly. The epidemiological model is an aggregate model. Exactly. But if, if it was totally micro-founded, instead of that, you wouldn't have new S and new L, but you would have a sort of physical model of meeting people exactly. uh, with a probability yeah. of contagion and meeting people is uh, part of the you know, consumption or production process. Exactly. And, uh, and there are some papers in the literature that do exactly this. Um, the difficulty with this is that you then need additional state variables, uh, which, we, which we can sort of save here. Uh, but yes, that would have been an additional way of doing it. We take this sort of a more reduced form way uh, and, and stick it in, a, in, in the utility fund. Okay. Um, here are the budget constraints of the households. Uh, it's sort of a standard Ayagari model uh, with two assets, so liquid and illiquid assets, the way uh, Greg and Gianluca and I like it. So we just borrowed this from our other paper. Um, Z is idiosyncratic income risks, okay? And so that's just an exogenous uh, process that drives all the heterogeneity. But then on top of that, relative to standard Ayagari models, we have this heterogeneity across occupations, okay? And in each occupation, in particular, there's an occupation-specific wage, WJ, and then uh, this thing here is your occupation-specific total efficiency hours of, uh, of, of work, where again, this FJ, this flexibility, so how well you can work remotely is gonna show up, okay? Uh, and as I've said to Gilles before, there's some imperfect substitutability in the utility function between LW and LR, which is gonna mean that you're not gonna have a bang-bang solution here. Okay, um, I think that's kind of it. Uh, again, there's sort of transaction costs between the liquid and the liquid assets. So whenever I say liquid assets, I mean, is essentially like your checking and your saving account. Whenever I say illiquid assets, uh, I mean uh, your house or your 401k retirement account. And uh, as we know, I would argue by now, it's kind of important to distinguish between these and in particular what matters for the, for the ability to smooth income shortfalls or buffer uh, against these is your liquid wealth, not your total wealth. Okay. Finally, the sick households here, they're kind of gonna be essentially out of, out of the model. Uh, we assume they're basically just in a hospital bed and the government feeds them. Okay, um, just very briefly, uh, how do we think about lockdowns? Um, there's gonna be two types of margins on which lockdowns operate. Um, we have sort of locked, a part of the lockdowns affect uh, the social sector. The way we're gonna model this here is uh, just a mandated decrease in the capital utilization in the social sector. Um, so we're gonna stick in here uh, a kappa S here, which is the fraction of your capital, say your floor space in a restaurant that you can use, and then a lockdown is gonna be a, a decrease in the kappa. So complete lockdown would be kappa S equal to zero, but you could have a partial lockdown, say, uh, where you say restaurants can only use 50% of their uh, of their space, exactly the way we sort of see it, I think, in a lot of countries now. Um, the second margin of lockdowns is going to be uh, workplace lockdowns. Um, so that's going to be uh, a mandated maximum uh, uh, amount of workplace hours. Um, the way we're going to model this here is uh, that your workplace hours or the share of your workplace hours has to be less than some, some number. So for example, again, a kappa L equal to zero would be everyone has to work from home uh, completely. So everyone has to work remotely. Um, I've already said this, so full lockdown would be this. One thing you can see immediately is that lockdowns sort of by assumption here are gonna be uh, effective in terms of reducing infections. Why? Because uh, the transmission rate here depends on how much social consumption there is, and it depends on how much workplace hours there are. Uh, so therefore the lockdown operates directly on these margins. Uh, and, and therefore reduces transmissions. You can also see that lockdowns are kind of uh, similar or affect the same behavioral margin as the pandemic itself. Uh, in particular, right, I told you that the pandemic itself uh, by raising deaths here affects social consumption and how much you work because of this feedback through the utility function. And um, that also then would uh, reduce infections there. Um, Finally, what I'm going to show you later is that the effect of the lockdowns on the flexible occupations uh, is, is, is 
in large part going to depend on how much technological substitutability is uh, there's going to be between the inputs because the flexible occupations still have to work together uh, with the rigid occupations. Okay, here are the main remaining model ingredients. Um, you know, monopolistic intermediate goods producers firms, uh, they, they produce these final S&C goods. Um, in our baseline model, uh, we, we have flexible prices actually. In the original draft that some of you may have seen presented, uh, we actually had sticky prices, which is uh, why the paper at the time was called Pandemics According to Hank. Um, now it's not uh, a new Keynesian model anymore. There's no sticky prices. So, which was part of the reason why we changed the title. Um, uh, we don't think this is super essential for, for, for the results, essentially. The liquid assets here, we're going to have an, a fund that sort of uh, uh, invests into, uh, takes the liquid assets of the households and then channels them into productive capital. Um, there's a government, the government uh, issues liquid debt, uh, spends, government spends, spending and uh, taxes and transfers and then uh, we're going to have in particular later on put great care into modeling the CARES Act and uh, for now we have this assumption here that the central bank uh, in the short term absorbs the additional uh, debt needed to finance the CARES Act. Okay, um, This is an assumption otherwise the interest rates uh, kind of move very strongly here in, in our model. We can discuss this later. Okay. Briefly about the parameterization, I'm not going to show you uh, uh, all the details due to time constraints. Uh, essentially, the SEIR model we're going to parameterize using epidemiological and clinical studies. Um, uh, just to tell you, we have sort of a, an uh, effective, sorry, an, an uh, basic reproduction number of 2.5. Initially, over time, it uh, falls a little bit uh, uh, to two. So these are kind of standard uh, parameters. Um, we have a, an infection fatality rate of uh, 0.5 or 0.6 percent, I think. So kind of relatively standard parameters from the literature. For the occupations, um, we're going to measure people's work from home ability or flexibility by occupation. Uh, from ONET, there's questions in these, uh, and, and the American Time News Survey, there's questions in these surveys that allow you to do that. Uh, the sectoral employment intensities, um, we're going to go uh, uh, to, to the CPS and uh, just look at, in terms of the occupational classifications, what sectors do these occupations uh, uh, mostly work in and infer it from this. And then we're going to estimate um, uh, earnings processes uh, by occupations from the SIP, and we're gonna take liquid wealth numbers by occupations um, also from the SIP. Uh, yeah. uh, and in particular, what you can see, do I have it here? No. Um, let me just briefly tell, show you this. Okay, no, my hyperlink doesn't work. What you can see is that uh, liquid wealth in the, uh, most vulnerable occupations, so in particular what we call these sort of flexible occupations, uh, is, uh, sorry, the rigid occupations, is, is the lowest. So there's a very strong uh, correlation, positive correlation between how good you are at working from home and how uh, high your liquid wealth is. Um, this two-way feedback between the virus and economic activity, um, we're going to calibrate in some way. Um, First, there's sort of the feedback from economic activity um, to the virus. Um, so that's this beta function there. Uh, we're going to calibrate that from how much um, the, uh, uh, this should be the effective reproduction number, sorry, not the basic reproduction number, uh, dropped um, after the lockdown. Um, and the uh, virus to economic activity feedback, um, in particular for how much people dislike going to the workplace, if there's, a, if there's a virus circulating, we're going to use estimates from the uh, value of statistical life literature uh, to discipline this. Uh, in particular, we're going to use how much of a pay premium do you get in occupations uh, where there's a, a higher risk of death, and then you can use that into this utility feedback. Uh, we've also done other things. So in particular, you can use the drop in economic activity before lockdown measures uh, started to uh, try to get at this uh, but yeah, that's what we did for now. Okay.
Let's, let me show you the results. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a bunch of lockdown scenarios uh, first, and I'm first going to show you the results sort of just the lockdown scenarios and no fiscal policy, which is obviously a, a counterfactual that we didn't see in the world. And then uh, later on, I'll show you uh, both lockdown and fiscal policy. So there's going to be one point on the frontier that's going to be what we think is sort of the US experience to date. Uh, and then all the other points I'm going to show you are essentially going to be counterfactuals. Okay, so we're going to um, have the following lockdown scenario. So we're going to have, uh, uh, again, both uh, the lockdown affecting workplace hours and uh, how intensely or how, how much social activity there is. The lockdown here is going to be instituted on uh, the 1st of April 2020. Um, in reality, it was like a few days earlier. Um, and then it's going to last, um, the full lockdown is going to last until uh, the beginning of June. Okay, so that's the shaded area. So in all graphs, shaded area is going to mean lockdown. And then the lockdown is going to be sort of phased out um, over time pretty quickly. Um, how do we come up with these initial uh, increases in the, in, the, in the lockdown or how intense this lockdown is? We essentially calibrated uh, these to obtain the decline in workplace uh, hours and retail activity we, we saw in Google Mobility data. Um, another thing I should point out is there's an important assumption here, which is uh, sort of going forward, especially for the, for the um, uh, predictions or the model simulations going into the future, um, we assume here that there are no future lockdowns in the case uh, uh, of a second wave, uh, which there will be a second wave, just to preview this um, in, in our model. And the assumption here is that the government does not respond uh, with lockdowns. Obviously, we cannot see into the future. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and you could try out uh, different scenarios here. Okay. So <laughs> this is our first set of results. Um, just. To, to show you this. Um, focus on the graphs on the left here first. Um, can, I, can I ask a question, a quick question? Absolutely, hey Christina. Yes, hi. Um, so in terms of your lockdown, so as you know, the details of the timing of the lockdown, and I guess given the mapping from the lockdown to the reproduction number, effective reproduction is going to have uh, very important effects on what happens with the epidemic. So why did you, I guess you're gonna have multiple scenarios, but this one that goes back to zero very quickly, you know, will have a second wave, whereas if you would do it a little bit slower, maybe you wouldn't have. So how did you, I guess, choose, why, why is this one the baseline? So our, so, so the name of the game right now is to basically do something that we think is a reasonable proxy to what US policy has looked like to date, um, not to find one that does well. So this is supposed to be a positive description of, uh, of, of sort of US policy. And uh, we think that essentially there was a pretty tight lockdown, but that got lifted uh, pretty quickly and is essentially uh, uh, not Oh, but the fear factor is gonna kick also in. So, so people are still not going to restaurants now. I guess yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and you'll see this here, like the economic activity is way below uh, 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 the initial steady state now, even though the lockdown has ended. Um, okay, got it. From the fear factor. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks for setting me up. Actually, so this is a good way to talk about these results. Um, so first of all, only focus on the on the two left-hand panels here and ignore what's on the right. Um, and I just want to show you, as a comparison, what happens in our model uh, in a, a full laissez-faire scenario and uh, this lockdown scenario that I just showed you. So first, let's look at the laissez-faire, which is the, the, just the blue line. Okay, and then afterwards we'll look at the uh, lockdown, uh, which is the orange line. Um, obviously, to be clear, the, the laissez-faire, right, is obviously a counterfactual that we haven't seen and we haven't seen in any country. I mean, not even Sweden, people sometimes talk about this, but they actually have a lot of restrictions in place. Um, so this isn't, isn't this. Um, what you can see is that uh, the ep epidemic, so this is monthly death rate, and this is output. If you look at other uh, uh, epidemiological uh, dynamics like infections, they look very similar. Or if you look at uh, consumption or uh, social consumption qualitatively, they look very similar. So what you can see with laissez-faire, you get a huge spike in deaths 
Uh, part of this is because the ICU constraint is breached um, and then the epidemic sort of subsides relatively quickly. Even in this laissez-faire scenario, you get a huge recession, okay? Um, at least there's a, there's a week or, or a day where uh, output here, uh, when deaths are at, the, at their peak, falls by 15% uh, here. Um, and then it goes back relatively quickly. But, you know, it's kind of persistent and stays below uh, the initial uh, uh, peak or the initial steady state very, for a very long time. In contrast, consider uh, this sort of a lockdown scenario here, um, which is again, a lockdown just for these two months, um, uh, this, this shaded area here. So the lockdown essentially uh, is pretty efficient or, or pretty uh, effective at suppressing infections and deaths. So you, you prevent this big spike in deaths here and uh, deaths go down. Okay, so exactly kind of uh, maybe what we've, what we've seen in the US. But then uh, once the lockdown is lifted, you get a, a, a infections rising again and you get a second wave happening, which uh, peaks here uh, in, the, in the sort of late fall of 2020. Um, what's the effect of this on, on, uh, on output or economic other measures of economic activity again look the same? So you initially get um, output falling uh, a lot, that's from the lockdown, so more than 20 percentage points um, over this uh, uh, short time period here. If you look over a longer time period, like a quarter, it's, 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 it's much less than this. Then output recovers pretty quickly, but doesn't go fully back to steady state. And then once there's a second wave, you actually get another decrease in economic activity. <clears throat> and that's what I uh, referred to in the introduction as the sort of a double dip recession, right? So the first dip is from the lockdown, the second dip is from the second wave and the associated fear factor. Okay. Uh, these are, um, ooh, let me actually skip this. So this is what happens to different occupations. Um, you can see there's uh, all the occupations are kind of hit kind of roughly in the same way that you'd expect, but there are some big differences uh, between, the, between the lockdown scenarios uh, and the laissez-faire for particular occupations. Okay. So let me show you our sort of first pandemic possibility frontier. Uh, and I'll probably go like two minutes over if that's okay. So this is um, the pandemic possibility frontier um, for the case uh, where there's only a lockdown but no fiscal policy. Um, this is the laissez-faire scenario. Uh, this is the lockdown scenario I showed you, what we call here US lockdown, so two months lockdown. And these are progressively longer lockdowns, okay? So first thing you can do, you can see is that um, welfare costs are very large, even in sort of a, a laissez-faire scenario. What's this thing here on the y-axis? This thing here is economic welfare cost as measured by a, a compensating differential. So how much money would I have to give you to compensate you for having lived through this pandemic? Um, and even in the laissez-faire case, on average, you have to give people uh, sort of two and a half times their monthly income to comp compensate them, which is a large number. And then for some people, it's almost like three and a half times uh, their monthly income. Um, yeah, sorry, what I should have said, obviously these, these, these bands here are different percentiles of the distribution of economic outcomes. And then you can sort of think about uh, when you, as you do more, as you do more lockdowns, you get, you reduce the number of deaths, but you kind of have a little bit of a trade-off and you increase uh, uh, the economic welfare cost. Initially, the trade-off is actually pretty, uh, pretty good. So this PPF here is pretty flat. Um, at some point then, if you increase the length of the lockdown, you get uh, the, the economic welfare cost just kind of skyrocket. And in particular, the heterogeneity really blows up on you. So some people just really get killed uh, if, you, if you did say a 12 month lockdown. Okay. Uh, this nonlinearity I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A uh, comes from a bunch of different things, in particular the ICU constraint uh, here, and then at some point you have a vaccine arrival. Okay. Uh, these are the distribution of economic welfare costs. Um, it's actually very uh, unequal uh, and in, in interesting ways. So this is uh, earnings decels, and this is uh, you know, what would happen in laissez-faire. Um, this is, the green line is what happens in the lockdown scenario. And then the final one is, uh, and which I'll talk about later, is uh, what happened with the uh, lockdown plus fiscal stimulus. And what you can see is that through the lens of our model, 
uh, the welfare costs are actually the largest uh, in the middle of the distribution. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about this later. Um, but let me maybe move on. Let me show you uh, one more thing, which is what happens to this pandemic possibility frontier uh, when you have fiscal stimulus. So what fiscal stimulus does is it sh shifts out uh, the pandemic possibility frontier closer to the origin, right? How does it do that? It essentially doesn't affect deaths, but it reduces the economic costs. So essentially you get sort of a parallel downward shift here uh, in, the, in the frontier. And so through the lens of our model, uh, the, the CARES Act was actually a very effective way of reducing economic hardship. Um, let me show you one more thing and then conclude. Uh, so these are alternative policies, okay? And I just wanna uh, talk about this graph here very quickly, okay? The blue line is the mean frontier for the sort of just blunt lockdown that we talked about, okay? Obviously what you wanna do is sort of flatten this frontier. So find policies that do better in terms of this trade-off. Um, one thing we show is that through the lens of our model, a set of policies that does quite a bit better than just blunt lockdowns is tax-based policies, okay? Particularly, let's just uh, think about the, the orange line here. Uh, the orange line is a tax on social consumption, okay? So going to restaurants and so on, uh, sort of a Peruvian tax if you want. Um, and then the way we do it is we take the tax revenues from this tax and we rebate them to the people working in the restaurant industry. So that's sort of to buffer uh, the effect uh, uh, on them of, of not being able to work anymore. And you can see that uh, uh, this does way better uh, in terms of the trade-off. At the same time, you get a hugely heterogeneous uh, 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 outcomes here. And so some people actually do a lot better uh, and some people do a lot worse. Okay, let me conclude. Um, so, you know, the economic costs of the pandemic are large and heterogeneous, regardless of whether you have a less fair scenario or uh, different lockdowns. Um, we kind of like this uh, distributional uh, PPF way of thinking about it, because you can jointly think about the lives versus livelihoods trade-off and also who bears the economic burden. Uh, again, this is very nonlinear. Um, one reason why there's so much heterogeneity is uh, that this correlation between exposure, so how much your income drops, and vulnerability, so how much liquid wealth you have, which really tells you that uh, there's a lot of scope for fiscal policy, sort of social insurance policies. Uh, the CARES Act, through the lens of our model, shifts this PPF inwards, uh, so it reduces economic costs without increasing debts. Uh, and then finally, I didn't have time to talk, tell you that you, uh, you have a faster recovery of spending for low-income households, uh, and then these other two things. I've already said you can do better with Peruvian schemes and our model predicts the second wave and double bit recession. Okay, so let me uh, stop there and uh, hopefully there's some time for questions. Um, thanks very much. Okay, so now there is the open floor if I understand correctly, right? So, um, Feel free to talk before I start talking myself. <laughs> well, actually, I have a question, so maybe I can I can start. Uh, so, in the model, you have both liquid and illiquid wealth, but you don't tell us anything about capital. So, would it be equivalent to look at a model without capital and calibrate wealth to the liquid wealth only, or what do we have to learn out of capital dynamics? Or right. Uh, it's a good question we should think harder about. Um, so let me try to think on my feet. Um, I mean, so there is, so, so there obviously is, uh, I mean, just to be clear for everyone, um, I, I think Excel uh, knows this. Um, so obviously, yeah, the, the illiquid wealth is um, uh, used uh, as, uh, does end up in the capital stock of the economy. Um, but so why do we need it? So there, sorry, there, there is actually one thing that's important where we use the uh, illiquid wealth. Um, and I should have just thought of that immediately, which is uh, one component of the CARES Act was actually to um, allow people costless withdrawals from their uh, 401k retirement accounts. 
okay? okay. So you can, uh, uh, so usually there's a transaction, the way we model this, usually there's a transaction cost. The government says, now this transaction cost is much less. I see. Uh, in our model, that's a very good policy, right? Because you give people, uh, in particular, these sort of wealthy hand-to-mouth guys that Greg and Luca like talking about, you give them uh, uh, cheap access to liquidity. And that actually uh, is part of the reason why this uh, PPF shifts downward so much. So I think that's probably the main thing that you couldn't think about if you didn't have the illiquid wealth. But yeah. it can keep the main reason because and the first order shouldn't care as be a pure uh, redistributive policy in your model. So here, I mean, okay, let me, so, so here's what we have in terms of the CARES Act, I can tell you. So we have like the, what we thought were sort of the four main components. There you go. So here's, here's the main things we model in, uh, in terms of the CARES Act. And again, our reading was in terms of just dollars, these were the, the biggest things. So we have a stimulus check, which uh, everyone uh, talked about, which is, uh, I guess, uh, either 1,200, uh, so it's, it's so 1,200. Who, pay, who pays for it? The government. Uh, the government is us, so. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, there's a government budget constraint that, that holds. Right. Um, and, uh, and so it uh, cannot, this alone cannot reduce economic costs for everybody. It has to increase it for those who foot the bill. Yeah, yeah, and you can, you can see, uh, if you look at the economic um, welfare consequences um, across the distribution, you can see there are some people who lose a little bit. Um, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, this is not a model where, so our model is obviously a model where uh, the recording equivalence doesn't hold, um, A, and, uh, and B, uh, the, 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 few, the way we model this is the, 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 the increased debt is repaid like, you know, 50 years later, um, uh, or 50 to 100 years later by increasing taxes a little bit in the future. I mean, what worries me is that your, your benchmark economy might be so inefficient that uh, at least some of those policies would improve welfare regardless of whether there is a pandemic or not. I, I, so, think, uh, I think that's it's clear to I me that you want to compare, you know, pandemic plus CARES versus pandemic without CARES, uh, without having. Uh, Fair enough. I mean, other comparison benchmark, which is, you know, uh, is there a set of policies that improve things uh, regardless of the pandemics? So I agree that's an interesting question, but I, I think you're probably right. And so we haven't done this exercise, but I think you're probably right because, I mean, in, in our model, we, I mean, we take the view that we try to write a realistic model of households. And what we see in the data is for better or for worse, some people have uh, low liquid wealth uh, and have very low incomes. And so then if you redistribute, that's uh, gonna increase economic welfare here. Um, it, it, the, or the average economic welfare here. Of course, uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, it, it, it's gonna, you know, you're gonna have some people losing and some people winning, which is exactly why we like showing these uh, distributional PPS where you can track each uh, person's individual welfare. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you take some money from someone who's uh, uh, very rich in our model and you give it to someone else who's very poor, has very low liquid wealth, uh, and low income, you're gonna, in general, increase uh, the welfare of the poor person more, uh, then you're gonna decrease the, the welfare of the rich person. I mean, that's just the, the way our model works and like most heterogeneous Asian models, I think. And you can like that or not. Um, I mean, I'm gonna sort of stay. I suppose, for example, looking at the fourth item, 401k withdrawals, um, there is no uh, behavioral bias in your uh, in your model that would imply that that those restrictions are a good idea, right? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. But if I, if I forget about the pandemics, okay? I assume that your model is the correct model, right? Then there is no reason on earth why um, 401k would even exist in this world, right? I mean, 
would probably want to scrap it uh, no matter what, right? So the fact that these uh, accounts are being made more liquid in an emergency situation um, is a good thing uh, regardless of the fact that we are in an emergency. Right? I mean, I agree with you partly, but no, it's going to be more powerful uh, in a situation where people have like right. it's more powerful because people need it but in your in the world of your model it's a stupid regulation in the first place that's right right i mean i don't know i haven't thought about the there's no trade off between doing that and i think some people being you know uh, inefficiency poorer in the long run because they withdraw too much because there is no such mechanism in the first place. I think that's right. So let me moderate, Gilles. Um, maybe do we have time for a last question? Because time is actually running. Maybe, maybe I can, I, can I, I don't know if I'm going to ask oh, one more question. Okay. So do you have um, implications on the paths of the pandemics uh, relative to the data? So I guess initial, um, uh, you know, this high R reproduction numbers, we generate a lot of deaths many more than what we've uh, seen i guess so i don't know uh if uh um so you, know, if yeah. you have some implications of that yeah. yeah so let me show you so i haven't plotted on the same uh graph as uh as the data but i think we the model actually does pretty well in terms of that um uh, compared to actual data and in, in fact our deaths are a little bit lower now um, okay here here are the cumulative deaths um that our model predicts in terms of like thousands of people for the US. Um, if you read the newspaper, I guess you will have seen that, I guess we either just crossed or will cross in the next few days, 200,000 deaths in the US, right? Um, yeah. Relative to that prediction, and so we're sort of in mid-September here, um, our model has a little bit less deaths, so it has like 190,000 deaths right now. Um, and we're in the model, well, deaths only cross 200,000 in, in, uh, in the beginning of October. Um, so it does, it does, does less bad here. Also, you know, extrapolating forward, our, uh, our prediction for deaths here uh, by the end of the year, so January 1st, 2021, is something like 350,000 people or 360,000 people. If you look at the epidemiological forecast, so for example, there's the IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics, uh, and, and I forget what the E is for. Um, they actually have more than 400,000 deaths by the end of the calendar year. So relative to that, we're pretty good, um, a little bit below. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I think you know, the fact that the, that the lockdown was effective in reducing number of deaths, um, but then there's a second wave, I think, is, is pretty reasonable relative to what uh, the epidemiologists think. And I'm, I'm sure you know that, but the, the number of deaths, of course, is very difficult to estimate. Uh, so, it's, so that's kind of hard. And the other thing that all of these models um, abstract from, including the stuff I've done, is the selection in the population who's dying. So we have a lot of infections of young people now who have very different death rates than elderly who unfortunately were so that's a complication that's just not you know it's maybe the next wave of models will get that too but yeah no 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 i mean I, as i said um on the epidemiological side our model is uh, uh, very simplistic i mean it's literally just a sure. sir model with two more states but i mean what we found interesting is that once you put a behavioral feedback in there i mean uh, in a reduced form fashion granted uh uh you do actually get pretty reasonable uh, dynamics in terms of uh, uh, deaths and things like the effective reproduction number, which becomes very close to one pretty quickly, exactly like we've seen in the data and so on. Um, well, it turns out it's really important to put people in epidemiology models. They don't have people in them, so. <laughs> right, right, no, exactly. So yeah, if we, if we, if we just run the plain vanilla uh, epidemiological model without the behavioral feedback, these numbers look way different. They're way, way higher, right? You get like much, much higher deaths much more quickly. Um, and the, the behavioral feedback really 
makes the numbers much more reasonable and also slows down the dynamics. But makes when there's overwhelming, there's a lot of micro evidence now that that basic force that economists are bringing to those models is in fact very powerful. Right. But we can talk about that separately. But yep, completely agree. Um, okay. So thanks very much. Um, so let me uh, stop there, I guess.